thanks for joining us. Before sharing this morning's message, I'd like to call your attention to some information that's scrolling at the bottom of your screen, which is concerning Truth Point Bible Church, a new church work that's being started in the Payson, Arizona area. Certainly your prayers, your interest, your financial support are much appreciated as we launch this work. Uh, we are fully incorporated in the state of Arizona, and as such, we can directly receive financial support, which we have detailed that information on your screen. We also are able to now receive online giving, uh, which via the QR code that you'll be seeing on your screen, if you wish to share in that way. And we just thank you for your partnership with us through prayer and through giving. Famous author Mark Twain stated that ain't, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It is the parts that I do understand. You know, some of the easiest passages of the Bible to understand are concerning how we ought to live. Knowing is the easy part. The real challenge is developing that lifestyle outlined in those verses. And we cannot overstate the importance of this lifestyle we're called to live because we can state that everything rises and falls on how closely we live according to what it is that we say. So the walk, so to speak, either validates or it discredits the talk. And more than ever, a skeptical and a cynical culture looks very closely at us to see if we really believe what we say and whether we live in harmony with that which we profess. James 2.17 says that faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. Now in our recent studies, we focused on six key essential truths, such as God is one and number one, Jesus is the Son of God, the Kingdom of God is the message and the mission the dead are really dead, and so therefore resurrection is the key. And then today we note that lifestyle is the issue. So the question before us today then is this, what impact do these truths have on our lives? Does it make any difference in how we live if God is one and number one, or in how we live if Jesus is the Son of God? Does it make any difference in how we live if our destiny is to spend eternity on a new earth? And if death means that we totally cease to exist in every sense of the word, does that impact how it is that we live today? And if resurrection is the only way out of death, does that affect things like our vocation, our school, our leisure, community life and service, our commitment to living the Christian life? There is a fundamental fact that belief determines behavior, and this is an absolute. Everyone behaves according to what they believe. So things start with the right belief in order to have the right behavior. Now in 1 Timothy 3.15, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Now, one of the first things that we want to notice is that lifestyle is closely connected to community because Paul said how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. So the idea is that we are designed to live within the context of a, of a community of believers. Personal lifestyle is defined by corporate lifestyle. And as the saying goes that no man is an island, being a follower of Christ is not a solitary thing. We are clearly designed to live out our personal Christian life within a Christian fellowship. Now, the household of God is, according to 1 Timothy 3.15 that we just read, the church of the living God. Now, the word church comes from a Greek word ecclesia, which means the called out ones. It's very well described in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, which says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified, which means set apart, called out, sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, uh, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. 
Now, the very first time that we see the word church used is by Jesus himself in Matthew 16, 18, in response to Peter's great confession, where he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or the gates of hell, the gates of the grave, will not overpower it. The church we see being born on the day of Pentecost recorded in Acts, the second chapter. It is born miraculously through a dramatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that which is followed by an explanation of the phenomenon which the apostle Peter gives, and after that, which he declares the gospel to a large crowd, and there is a tremendous response of over 3,000 people who respond and are baptized and what resulted is especially interesting in light of what we've read here in 1 Timothy 3.15 about how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. Acts 2.42 says that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And if we jump down to verse 46, also in Acts 2, it says day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Now, we don't know whether these early believers were specifically taught in what they ought to do or whether they just had an inner conviction. The thing that's interesting is that they immediately began to live out their new lives as followers of Christ, very closely connected to other believers. And one thing that we note in what we just read in Acts 2, the first thing that is said about their community life was that they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is in harmony with what Paul said and told Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15 that we read that the purpose of the church is to be the pillar and the support of the truth. Now a pillar, we think of that as being like a large stone column which supports a building such as we see in government buildings in Washington, D.C., uh, the Capitol Building, the White House. We see that in the Lincoln, the Jefferson Memorials, for example. And similarly then, using that example, the church is to be that supporting column for the truth of God's Word. And that implies two very important things. Number one, that we know and that we are learning truth. And secondly, that we are active advocates of truth. How important, because you know, there is no other group and no other organization that has been tasked with this important priority concerning God's truth. So we are a pillar and a support of the truth, both in what we say, but also in how we live. So going back to the key fundamental truths we talked about a little bit ago, let's consider number one. If God is one and number one, what is it that he requires of us? Well, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9, we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. If our Heavenly Father is front and center in our lives as He needs to be, it is expressed through the totality of our being and in actively seeking to perpetuate this through very careful instruction of our children in various ways, as according to what we just read in our travels, in our time in our homes, the last thing at night, the first thing in the morning, and through helpful and appropriate symbols that ever serve as reminders that God is one and number one. Micah 6 verse 8 in terms of what God requires. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? So we're clearly told that what our Father requires of His people is a lifestyle that is characterized by the practice of justice, by a passion for kindness, 
and of a humility in walking with him. 1 John 3, verse 23 says, this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. What does God require of us? That we believe in Jesus, his son, the son of God. It is an active present tense faith that we are to have. We live daily by faith as we also practice a practical active love, agape love in the Greek, which is a sacrificial love for others. Now, secondly, if Jesus is the son of God and we are his followers, how then do his disciples behave? He says in Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28, whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we behave and live a servant lifestyle where we make the needs and the good of others a very important priority. Also, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Jesus says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation, or as Matthew's account says, go and make disciples of all nations. And he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, and he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So if we are followers of Jesus, the Son of God, we take to heart the mission of making disciples, of reaching those that are reachable, of training them thoroughly in truth, and then training them to reproduce their lives spiritually in the lives of others. Second Timothy 2 verse 2, very important verse about that replicating process. And then Jesus says in John 13, 34 and 35, he says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So the specific new commandment of Jesus is that we love others through service and action, agape love, a doing love. And this does not preclude affection, philia love, but it is much more than sentimental love that we are called to have for one another. Now this takes us to a third question, and that is if the kingdom of God is the message and the mission, then what does that demand of us? In Matthew 6, we are told by Jesus, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Make the kingdom priority number one. First Thessalonians 2 verse 12 says, walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So a, a lifestyle in harmony with the kingdom. Now, fourthly, the question before us, if the dead are really dead, how then do we live today? A couple of Psalms, Psalm 39 verse four, Lord reveal to me the end of my life and the number of my days, let me know how transitory I am. Psalm 90 verse 12, <clears throat> so teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Make every day count. Fifthly, if, the res if resurrection is the key, how does the hope of resurrection motivate us? First John 3 verse 3 says, and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. At 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Now we kind of catch our breath here for a minute. We've covered a lot of territory in only a few moments, a few minutes here this morning. And the really challenging aspect of it is that what we've covered is concerning lifestyle. And there's no quick and no simple way to live out what it is that we have learned. It's, it's a, an important process that can and that will take a lifetime. Lifestyle takes a lifetime. 
Well, I think the best way that we can summarize and conclude it today, what it is that uh, we're trying to clarify, a very important key in making lifestyle the issue. It comes down to this. Someone has said that we can approach Christian lifestyle one of two ways, the self-improvement plan or secondly, the supernatural plan. Now the self-improvement plan is determining on our own that we're gonna roll up our sleeves and we're gonna try harder. And that is a plan that will not work because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. We cannot try hard enough. The supernatural plan, secondly, is the plan that ultimately works. Galatians 5.16 says, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And we also read in Romans 8, verse 14, it says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So it, as we considered at the start here this morning that the church is the pillar and support of the truth, then a very important key to this is found in what Jesus said in John 16, verse 13, when he says, When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Lifestyle really is the issue and the empowering, the instructing, the comforting presence of Holy Spirit within us is really vital and necessary to it all. Let's close out our time this morning in prayer. Father God, we thank you for what you've revealed to us about lifestyle we realize it's pretty easy to understand what scripture says about how to live. That's not the real challenge. The challenge we realize is how to live out and to do what it is that you've said for us to do. For that we know we need power, we need wisdom. We also need that, know that we need to live collectively within a community of believers for accountability and encouragement. That certainly is an important theme that we see. You have designed us to be part of a fellowship of other believers. And so as we work together, as we hammer these things out, as we seek to together be faithful in these things, for one, we realize it's a great and a powerful witness to our culture and our community, but we realize it is vital for our own survival. None of us can make it as individual believers except that we are part of a community of believers. And so we see that theme so clearly. So we ask that you would direct us as individuals and as a group of believers, give us that wisdom, that discipline, that determination, that accountability that we might live this lifestyle you have called us to. And so we've looked at many verses today and they all speak clearly to us about how we should live and it is our desire to do so. We know we can try to live it and we know we'll fail, but we know that as we submit to your spirit, as we allow your spirit, that inner power, even the inner presence of Christ to work it out, there's so much better chance of success in that. And so may we yield to your spirit. May we follow the promptings of your spirit and may we grow more and more like Christ so that on that day we can look forward to seeing him and being like him as he is even now. What a great hope and a great promise. We thank you for these moments that we have shared together in looking at your word, letting your word speak to us and direct us. Again, we seek discipline and wisdom in how we might live these things out. I thank you for each one who's joined us today. May your rich blessings be upon them, upon each of us, and again, may we be in a community with each other in whatever ways we can. Some of us are at a great distance, <clears throat> but I pray that you might use ways in which we can, again, be together and help each other in this journey toward the coming kingdom of God. We know it will come when Jesus returns and we look forward to that day. And even as we pray, Lord Jesus, in your name, we pray, even so come Lord Jesus, may that time and that day be soon, amen. I thank you once again for taking time to join us this morning. It has been my great privilege and honor to be able to share God's word with you. I know we've covered, as we said, a lot of territory, but uh, <clears throat> trust on our own and in our group, our fellowship of believers that we would hammer these things out and that we would be faithful to develop that lifestyle. Again, I thank you for joining us and I look forward to having you join us next time as we again gather together and share together from God's word. Until that time, so long and God bless.